Today, I'm going to talk with you about overcoming the self-inflicted torment of why. Overcoming the self-inflicted torment of why. After every senseless tragedy, the resounding question is, why? There was a lawyer who killed his family out west. And people, but he was educated. He had money. Why would he do such a thing? You think of, of, of school shootings just this last week, on last Monday in Nashville. The whole city was gripped with the question of why? Why would a young lady believe that she is a male and go in and shoot people, innocent people? Why? And the more you ask the question why, the more bitter you can become. Because you don't, it just doesn't make any sense. Why would someone do, why would, why, why would God allow me to be born into a family that doesn't care for me? Why, why did my husband leave me? Why did God allow my baby to die? Why, why, why? And we torment ourselves with why. Why are these things so? It's because of this, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick or wicked beyond cure by human effort. Who can understand it? Now, this flies in the face of most Christian churches, most churches here in America. Most people believe that you know, we're pretty good. You ask someone when you die, where are you going? I'm going to heaven. I'm a, I'm a good person. And so if we believe this untruth, then we wonder why, why did they do it? The reason why the young lady did what she did is because the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Why did Hitler do what he did? The heart is desperately sick. Why do human beings do what they do? Is because the heart is desperately sick. And it's because of the fall of Adam that we are born with a heart condition. A heart conditioned to sin. A heart conditioned to unrighteousness. All of the world has this heart condition. But if you don't believe this, nothing makes sense. This is the most hated doctrine of the Christian faith. It is the most hated. Why? Because it describes the total depravity of man. There are people who do not believe in the total depravity of man. They believe that, well, we can make our own decision whether or not we can follow God. We have our own free will. This tells us that we, our will is not free. Our will is slave to unrighteousness. And it cannot be fixed by human effort. Why is this the most hated? Because people are offended when you tell them they are evil and there is nothing they can do to change it. That's where the gospel begins. It does not begin with God loves you. It begins with the holiness of God. God is holy and we are not. And there's nothing we can do about it. And because people think that we're basically good, a gun used in the act of violence is human violence, not gun violence. How many times have you heard gun violence, gun violence, gun violence? That gun could do nothing apart from human interaction. It's because they refuse to acknowledge sin is sin. It was the gun. Huh? Or you hear that the, the, he was speeding down the street and the SUV ran over. The, the SUV didn't run over anybody. The person driving ran over the person. But because the world is adverse to calling sin, sin, you have to blame somebody or something. But as children of God, we know that the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Amen. 
This is where we start our understanding of the human condition. Romans says the same thing. Romans 3 verses 9 through 18. What then? Are we any better? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. You see, the Bible is the only book. Christianity is the only faith that teaches this. Every other false religion says that you have enough in you to work out your salvation so you can be right with God. That's what Catholicism teaches, that if you go to enough masses, if you say enough prayers, if you do this, you do that, then you can be saved. But perchance you don't do it, you can go to purgatory to pay for your sins. That is the doctrine of demons. If you can do anything to pay for your sin, Jesus Christ came here and died for nothing. It is the doctrine of demons. Muslims, all of it is the doctrine of demons saying that there is something good in you that enables you to make yourself right with God. That is a demonic lie. No one is born righteous. No one is born good. How do we know? No one leaves this earth alive. It is the curse that God has placed upon all humanity because no one is innocent. So if we understand, we stop asking why, 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 why? The reason, the answer is humans are evil. Well, I thought we came to church to get a good message, to be made happy. Oh, you're going to get happy in a minute. See, this is why Joel Osteen says, well, I believe 99.9% .9 of the people that come to my church are basically good. That's a basic lie. According to the scriptures, no one's good. Isn't that what it says? Old Testament and New Testament, verse 11. There is no one who understands what? God's truth and standard of righteousness. No one understands it. There is no one who seeks God. Verse 12. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. There is no one who seeks God. So how can you put out a, a questionnaire? There was a church in the Chicago area that put out a questionnaire asking unsaved people what they're looking for in a church. Seeker sensitive. And a lot of churches do the same thing. Why do you see the dark lights and the phone and, 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 the, and, and the, the band coming out and they're playing all this kind of music? Why is it? Because they're trying to give unsaved people what they want. The sheep don't want that nonsense. The sheep want to be fed the word of God. And nine times out of ten, all of these big ministries, these young ministries, if you got rid of the music, the ministry would fold. Christianity is the only faith that offends because it tells the truth about the human condition. There is nothing we can do to contribute to our salvation. Well, you got to be baptized. Nope. That doesn't do it. You got to speak in a tongue. Nope. That doesn't do it. You got to keep the Sabbath. Nope, that doesn't do it. False religion is a demonic attempt of man to create God in the image that is acceptable to them. The first commandment is, thou shalt not have any other God before me. But people this Sunday morning have walked into churches to serve and worship the God of their own making. To worship the God that accepts homosexual marriage. To worship the God that accepts alternate lifestyles. The God who accepts abortion. The God who accepts all of this. And I'm here to tell you that's not the God of the scripture. It is demonic. The Church of England... Oh, we accept this. We have to have a dialogue. I want to tell you, when God has said it, that settles it. Whether we like it or not, God didn't create us so we could please ourselves. God created us so we could please him. Verse 13. 
Their throat is an empty grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You ever go to someone, an activist, pick your cause, and you go to them and preach the gospel, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Because the human being, the human condition is to hate the truth. People loved Jesus as long as he was healing them, feeding them. But it was the religious leaders through the government that killed Jesus. Why? Because of what he said. And what did he say? He told them they were evil and their whole religious system was evil. Oh, you, we can't have that. They loved him as long as he was doing what they wanted. But, as long, but once he told, exposed them for who they really are, the religious leaders. And what is happening in this country today? It is these churches, so-called churches, who accept any and everything. They are going to do exactly what they did to Jesus. Use the government to persecute the people of God. Oh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just a Bible believer because that's what the Bible says. So I just want to tell you, when you came into this world, you were going to have trouble. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. Oh, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And because he's overcome, you are an overcomer too. Verse 15, he says, this, the feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. And the paths of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. No justice, no peace. And wherever they go, the city is torn up. Right? Rioting. See, but here's the amazing thing. It's okay for them to riot. But if someone else riots, oh, we want to have a committee. Do you know that the state capitol in Nashville was taken over this week? Do you know that? But all they want to talk about is January 6th. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the goose. Same thing. Huh. So the world does not want to repent. So they don't want a God where they have to repent. They want a God who accepts everything. And if you don't accept, excuse me, it's not accepting, it's celebrating. It's you're supposed to celebrate them. I want to tell you, I will pop every balloon. If anyone tries to come up in here trying to get us to celebrate ungodliness, watch it. We're going to take a pin to every balloon. We're going to tear down every flag. Now, if you come in here with that condition and you want to be saved, come on in. You want to hear the good news of God? Come on in. But we're not going to let people come and tell us how we're supposed to act. Well, they'll say, well, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and sinners. Yes, he did. But he did not allow them to tell him what he should do. And he had never accepted their behavior. By the sovereign grace of God, things are going to get worse. Isn't that good news? Oh, it is. Because if it doesn't get worse, he's not coming. And how many of you want him to come? Okay, so the fact that things are going to get worse, see, so you got to understand, before our salvation was made complete, things got worse. Jesus was arrested, he was tried in a mock trial, and he was killed by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. The crucifixion didn't just happen, God planned for evil men to kill, to supposedly take his life. But Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I'll pick it right back up again. That's sovereignty right there. God is going to allow things to get worse. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning of verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you for it, meaning the coming of our Lord Christ and our gathering to him as described in verse 1. 
will not come unless the apostasy or rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed. The son of destruction. But isn't there destruction going on right now? How worse can it get? It's going to get worse. You see, you see, if you understand that, you stop asking why. You will understand that it is by the preordained plan of God that these things are happening. But, 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 but should he consider us? Why? What does God owe us? Get, get, let, let's, get, let's just get real. Let's just get real up in here. What does God owe you? And what does he owe me? Nothing. Not according to the God of most churches. God owes you a house. He owes you a job. He owes you healing. He owes you a blessing. You came to church. Get ready, get ready, get ready. God is going to bless you this morning. That's not the God we serve. Our God didn't come here to make us materially rich. He does bless some people with the ability to make money for his glory. But that's not why he came. He came us to make us rich in righteousness, rich in mercy, rich in grace, rich in love. And when you have that, you will understand that you have everything you need. The Antichrist will deceive many by coming as a man of peace. He will make an agreement with Israel that will last three and a half years after that. Then he will break the agreement and reveal who he really is. Verse four describes him who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Paul is saying this to the Thessalonians, those in Thessalonica, that I told you all about this, that he's going to come and build. He's going to sit in the temple of God. But people say, well, wait a minute. There's no temple in Israel. Matter of fact, the, the mosque or the Dome of the, Dome of the Rock is, is up there. How can that happen? Well, these are the same people that said that, well, Israel doesn't exist. How can, well, in 1940, is it 1948? Just like that, Israel existed, didn't it? And there are Jews in Israel today. Aren't there? And so here's the thing we have to remember. Just because we don't understand it does not mean God doesn't know how he's going to do it. The scripture says there are going to be two witnesses outside of Jerusalem and all the world will see them. Well, back in the 1970s, people, well, how's that? How, how, how's that going to happen? How, how many of you have a phone? You can open up your smartphone Tune in to Tokyo and Jerusalem, wherever you are in the world. You can look at the square in Jerusalem and see what's happening sitting right here in Russellville, Kentucky. God is not worried about what you're worried about. He knows what he's going to do. Verse 6. And you know what restrains him now. What is it? The power and the will of God. That's the only thing restraining him. So that in his time, at the, point, at the appointed time, he, the Antichrist, will be revealed. For the mystery or the spirit of lawlessness is already at work. Why? Because the heart is deceitfully wicked. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the world. What he's talking right now, Revelation talks about the angels of, who, who protect the four winds. And when they are removed, all hell is going to break loose. You think it's bad now? Nah. All hell is going to break loose. But Dana, I thought you said you're going to get some good news. Just hold on. Because bad news makes good news great news. Verse 8. Then that lawless one will be revealed. Whom, oh, we get here we go. Whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearing appearance of his coming. Now we get into the good news. God is going to allow all this. He's allowing all of this to happen right now. Don't get it. God. Where's your God? Atheists just say, well, if God is good, you know, he wouldn't allow this. You see, you don't know. You don't understand it. God didn't come so that he could save us from other people. He came to save us from our sin. And even if we are affected by other people, there's nothing they can do to our soul. It is well with our souls. 
God came to save our souls. And even if you are persecuted here in this life, God will, by his grace, save your soul. You see, I've had to talk to a young lady who was abused by family. What do you say to a young lady who's been abused by family? You don't tell them all of this, but you don't join them in asking why. You tell them about the goodness of God, but you can't t focus on the goodness of God if you yourself are still asking why. You've got to understand we live in a wicked world and sin touches each of us in different ways. Jesus Christ was betrayed. We too are betrayed by the ones who are closest to us. But the good news of the gospel is not that he allows us to be betrayed. The good news is that he takes the bitterness out of our hearts and we become like Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He changes us from our natural bent to hate, our natural bent for revenge, and changes us into creatures who want to see our abusers saved. Oh, amen. Amen. That's the good news. Verse 9. That is, meaning the one who's coming in accord with the activity of Satan, God's going to destroy him with all power and signs and false wonders. Verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So in other words, God is going to destroy Satan and all those who believe him who are perishing. So what does that mean? What does that, what does that mean? Because you are a child of God, you will never, ever believe the deception of the Antichrist why? Because the deception is meant for those who perish. Who are the ones who perish? The ones who do not believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't care what you heard in another church. People, I remember growing up, oh, we got to be ready. Make sure we're not deceived. I'm here to tell you by the grace of God, I'm not going to be deceived. Why? Because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. It's not because of me and it's not because of you. It's because of the grace of God. My question is, who's holding who? Are you holding on to God or is God holding on to you? But you hear, you got to hold to God's unchanging hand. Oh, yeah. You got to hold. Sounds nice. But God's not, you're not holding on to him. He's holding on to you. That's true salvation. Verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence. So that they will believe what is false. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God's not going to do that. There was King Ahab. King Ahab was a wicked king. And so God said, you know, I'm going to kill this man because he's wicked. So a deceiving spirit came to God and said, send me. I'll go. I'll put a lie in the mouths of the prophets. And God said, go ahead. Well, people don't. No, no, God would never do. It. Yes, he did. He did it as a form of judgment. Well, isn't that what's happening now according to Romans 1? He gave them over to a depraved mind, a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind cannot tell the difference. They cannot ask this simple question, what is a woman? That's a depraved mind. And what you're seeing is the judgment of God. He's allowing them to believe a lie because they refuse to believe the truth. It's right there in scripture. 
This is the God we serve, the God who hates sin, the God who punishes sin. But at the same time, he saves those who he wills so that we can know the truth and understand why these things are happening. So we don't torment ourselves. We don't have self-inflicted torment of why we understand it. Does it mean it doesn't hurt? Yes, it hurts. Yes, it cries. It hurt Jesus when he stood by the tomb of Lazarus and as he saw the sorrow all around him and it says Jesus wept. That doesn't mean we don't care, but we understand why. Verse 13. But we should always give thanks. <laughs> but we should always, instead of all, in spite of all that, but we should always give thanks to God for you. You who? Brethren, beloved by the Lord. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification or being set apart from sin, the fears of this life and of eternal judgment. How? By the spirit and faith in truth. Why is this good news? It doesn't matter what family, which family you were born into. It doesn't matter what they've done. To you. It doesn't matter. Yes, it hurts. I'm not diminishing the pain. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it causes us to cry. But the good news is that you are loved by the Lord. And how do you know you're loved by the Lord? Because you're sitting here trusting him today. Why are you trusting him? Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Amen. So when you understand that, you stop tormenting yourself. Why? 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 And then you start asking another question. I don't know why he loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad, so glad he did. Jesus Christ died to save us from our sin, even the sin of bitterness against our abusers. That's the gospel. It's hard. Forgiving someone is humanly impossible. It's impossible. But by the grace of God, it is possible. And we forgive others not so we can feel better, as I said last week. We don't forgive other people so we can feel better ourselves. Because what is that? That is selfishness. We're just trying to do what we can to make ourselves feel better. We forgive others because God has forgiven us. And in light of what he has done for the glory of God, we forgive others. That's the spirit of God living in us. Verse 14. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain in its completeness the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But until he appears, we will be vexed as Lot was vexed with the evil that he saw around him. And at times wicked people will persecute us and sometimes cause bodily harm. Yes, it will happen. It happened in the past and it's going to happen again in the future. But as Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are afflicted in every way. Isn't that right? We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Can someone say thank you, Jesus? Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down. We may be killed. But we are not destroyed. Why? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but through our, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man, our soul is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. What we go through here is nothing compared to the glory that awaits us when Jesus comes again. Do we believe this? When you believe this, you will have the peace of God no matter what anyone does to you. No matter what anyone says about you, no matter how people feel about you, you will go on knowing that you are the precious child of God 
who sent his son, son Jesus to die and shed his blood so that you might receive his righteousness. Verse 18. How do we do this? How do we not ask this why? Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. What is that? The glory we will share with Christ. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We serve an eternal God who is eternally good. Second Thessalonians 2.15 says this. So then, knowing all of this, having a better understanding of why, so then, brother, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions. What traditions? The instruction and doctrine which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. In other words, from the scriptures, once for all, hand it down to the saints. In other words, <clears throat> do not forsake the assembly. What is, what is the Christian tradition? Do not forsake the assembly one another of, uh, with one another. Don't forsake it. Greet each other with hymns and spiritual songs. Encourage one another. Esteem others above yourself. If we do these things, then we will be able to get through this hard life so that we can walk into the new life with Jesus Christ. Never to face sickness. Never to face sorrow. Never to face betrayal. Never to face darkness. Never to face abuse. Never to face assault. Never to face all the things that come against us right now. Why? Because God has prepared in his sovereign wisdom to deliver us out of this kingdom and bring him into the kingdom of light so that we can enjoy him forever. This is how we stop the self-inflicted torment of why, 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 oh why. I tell you why. Because people are evil. Life is hard, but God is good. We've all been through trials. We've all been through hurts. We've all been through disappointment. There's not now one of us in here. All of us have had disappointment. Amen. But God is good. Why? Because you are trusting him today. And the only reason you're trusting him is because of the goodness of God. It's because of his mercy toward you. And because of his mercy toward you, he's going to keep you. He's going, uh, he's going to keep you. And the spirit of God is in you whereby you're able to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And part of that fruit is self-control, love, joy, and peace, patience. All of those things are yours right now. Right now. The Spirit of God working in you will cause you to understand the why. Men are evil. This world is cursed. But you will say, I serve a good God because he saved me from my sin. And change my heart so I can love those who do not love me. Just as my Savior did. Amen. Amen. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, that every, every question is answered in the scripture. Lord, we, we hurt. We, we, we grieve over tragedy. We grieve, but we do not grieve as those without hope. We have the blessed hope of salvation, the renewal of our bodies, that this is not all there is. And Father, may we be sensitive to the needs of our brothers and sisters. And may we not be ashamed to proclaim the gospel in the midst of people wondering why. For it and it alone is your power unto salvation. May we not resort to human effort and human philosophy, but may we stand strong and tall on the word of God, which is a lamp to our feet, light to our path, which is the rock we stand on. When the storm comes, we will not be shaken. And we know it's only by your grace and mercy. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.